Well, good morning and welcome to Grace. Let's just bow our heads in prayer. Father, this morning I pray that every person here would look up and see no one but you in their lives and in this room. Help every person to see you in a new and a fresh and an enlightened way. And help us to be able to give ourselves to you freshly and newly. And thank you for the ways you're working in our lives. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, so here we are, week two of Advent season. It's the week of love. And I love the season of Advent, and I love what it represents to us. And this year our theme is not as much focused on the little baby in the manger, although we celebrate that on Christmas Eve. The real theme is the coming of the King. And we are preparing during this Advent season for the coming of the King. And if you know me, you know that I love for us to give presents. So there's some presents we have to help you celebrate this season as well. The first one has to do with your children. We have this little nativity sticker activity book for each of your children. If you take one for each child, they are at the, well, or the hospitality counter as you leave the church today. There is a second gift, which is for your entire family. It's called the Star, A Journey to Christmas, this is a devotional for every day of the Advent season that you can sit down with your kids. It's got a little activity, a very short story and a time that you can spend with your kids to be able to share the story of Jesus. And the third one, if you know our dear brother, Glenn Lockman, he's the guy that runs around the church giving everybody crosses. And that's not just here, that's kind of everywhere. Well, what he does every year is he also does this little scene, and he makes these. And we have one of these available for each family. So if you take one for each family. Now, I want to note, this is not a manger scene. He was very specific in telling me, this, is, this isn't a nativity scene, it's a manger scene. What's the difference? Nativity scene, Jesus is in the manger. There's shepherds, and there's, and there's wise men, and there's animals. What his vision was when he made this was that Mary and Joseph were kneeling, praying to God before the birth of the Savior of the world and praying for him when he came into this world. So feel free to take one of these, um, each one, for each, well, one for each of your families. And Merry Christmas to you as a result of that. And it's interestingly enough that on this week we're talking about love, I want to talk about control. As weird as that may sound, I want to talk about control. Because when I am in control, I can't get closer to him. So as we prepare for the king in week two and talk about the love that overwhelms us, the Jesus that is beyond us, I want us to grasp the reality that we should not, cannot be in control in the midst of that. And my favorite author is Max Licato. I love him. He writes to my level. He, he writes in a way that I can understand him. And I'm going to be quoting him a lot. And I'd like to open today with a quote from Max Licato. And he says this, Boxes bring wonderful order to our world. When it comes to containing stuff, boxes are masterful. But when it comes to defining Christ, no box works. His contemporaries designed an assortment of boxes, but he never fit one. They called him a revolutionary, and then he paid his taxes. They labeled him a country carpenter, and he confounded the scholars. They came to, him, uh, they came to see his miracles, but he refused to cater to them. He defiled easy definitions. He was a Jew... Who attracted Gentiles. He was a holy man who hung out with street walkers and turncoats. In a male-dominated society, he recruited females. People tried to designate him. They couldn't. I can so identify with this. 
So I brought my box today. I brought my box. And somebody put $20 in it. Wow! Looky there! All right! <laughs> oh, they paid me to bring my box. This will be up here every week, by the way. <laughs> so, today I'm not feeling too good about myself. I know that I did something wrong last night. So it's time for me to pull Jesus out of the box. I pull out Exorcist Jesus. The Jesus is going to take the sin out of my life. And I'm going to pray to him and he's going to take that sin out of my life. And I love you, Jesus. Thank you for going on the cross for me. Thank you for dying for this sin in my life. Forgive me. Then I'm forgiven. So I don't need him anymore, right? So I put him back in a box. And then pretty soon, I need holy Jesus. And so I pull out holy Jesus. Now, if, you're, if you have a Catholic background, this is called the sacred heart of Jesus. This was my dad's when he was a kid, and he gave it to me, and this sits in a very prominent place in my house. And I need holy Jesus. I need to feel holy. I need to have Jesus do something in my life that I need. And so I pull out holy Jesus. And then I'm feeling pretty good about myself. I'm feeling pretty holy. I'm feeling pretty good about myself. I don't need that Jesus anymore. So I go about my life. And then pretty soon I recognize I'm not living in the power of the living God. So I need resurrected Jesus. So I bring resurrected Jesus in the, into the circle. I take him out of the box. And I say, holy smokes, Jesus. I ain't living in your resurrection power. And then I don't feel that resurrected anymore. So I put Jesus back in the box. And I have to start all over. I need to take that sin and have Jesus cast it out of me. And we do this over and over and over again. Jesus can't be put in a box. And you know why? Because he is all of those things. And he's all of those things at once. So you don't need to pull one out when you need it. He's there for you. And that's what I want you to get, how far beyond us he is. That's what the story today tells us. And I've wondered, why do I do this? Why do we as human beings do this? I think it's because we want to control our lives. It's natural for us to want to control our lives, right? And so we have these roles in life. And I've kind of discovered three of them. One of us is when you're the control freak, that you're the person that... You exercise 40 minutes every day, even if everybody else only does 30 minutes. You're the person that your file cabinet, every paper is in the file cabinet. You're the person that is so in control of your life that if people average seven minutes a day with their child, I'm going to spend 15 minutes. You're a control freak. You want to make sure that things are all in that little box called the control box. Another one is the short cutters. That's those of us who our life is such a mess and we're going a thousand miles an hour. And so I've got to procrastinate here so that I can try to finish something over here so that maybe I can get back to what I procrastinated about and finish that as well. And I'm trying to control my life. It's who I am, it's how I do life, and it's how I control my life. The third one is the bingers and the purgers. And this is a big one for Christians. We go along our life we're just not feeling good about ourselves, about our relationship with Jesus. So we decide, I need to do something. So we go to these Christian events. We go to church so I can get filled. I, we go to worship so that I can feel something with the living God. And, and, and then we get all filled up and we get all bound up and we get all happy about things. And then eventually, as is with us, with any of those modes of life, I live life, and pretty soon it goes by the wayside. And I'm kind of back to where I was to begin the whole process. Now, there's a problem with living life in control this way. You know what it is? It's because you're always one step away. If you are a control freak, think about it this way. I can do all these things to keep control of my life, but that means I am only one element of something not being controlled in my life. And I fall apart, right? Let that one thing jump off of my agenda. I don't know what to do with that. 
And so I want to fall apart. I don't know how to handle my life. And if you're a binger and a purger, or if you're a shortcut person, then I'm just one seminar. I'm just one spiritual experience away from the bliss of Jesus. But you know what else that means? I am just one seminar or one spiritual experience away from not having that in my life. Why is that? It's because the focus is on the wrong things. It's because I'm trying to control my environment in my life. And so I want to talk about control today. And what does control look like? And why don't I even need to take control? And I want to do that by giving you really two main ideas, two big ideas, two bottom lines for the day. And the first one is this. Not am I in control, but God is in control. And let me define this for you. This goes to the sovereignty of God. Let me define this for you. God's sovereignty is this. His kingship over everything based on his infinite power, wisdom, and authority. Now I want you to note what this means. This is about relationship. This is about the creator of the universe being sovereign over everything because of a desire to work his creation into relationship with himself. And I've just jotted down just a few places that he's sovereign. He's sovereign over nations. It says, The Most High is sovereign over the kingdoms of men and gives them to, every, uh, to anyone that he wishes. He's sovereign over people. Many are the plans in a man's heart, but it is the Lord's purpose that prevails. He's sovereign over circumstances. The Lord works out everything for his own ends, even the wicked for the day of disaster. God's sovereign over nature. You are worthy, O Lord our God, to receive glory and honor and power, for you created all things, and by your will they were created and have their being. And I would have added a fifth one. It's the fifth category. In Ephesians chapter 1, it says, He's seated above all power and authority. So he is, he is the God of the angels and the demons and Satan and us and creation and everything else. God's sovereign over it all. And see, here's the thing, as a theological statement, maybe I can buy that. Okay, God created it all, so God obviously is in control over it all. But then it creates the question, if God is in control, how in control is he? I mean, is he a God that created everything, created the universe, created the heavens and the earth and the animals and the trees and everything else, and then he created you and then he steps back? Is he the God that just kind of objectively steps back and looks at what happens? Is he the God that just intervenes and throws a, a, so, some magic trick, a miracle, just so that he can keep the status quo and the people happy? And even more than that, is he in control at all? That's a good question because that's where God's sovereignty is shown through his providence. I'm going to define providence. God's providence is God's sovereignty in action. In other words, this God that wants this relationship with his creation is saying to me that I can trust his sovereignty to be able to even have a relationship with him. It's about how active God is. Not just big picture stuff. I'm talking about in your life, down and dirty details of your life. It's not Christian luck when God is upon your life. That's what we come to recognize. It's like Hebrews chapter 1. Jesus upholds all things by his powerful word. Colossians 1, it says the same kind of thing. Jesus is before all things and in him all of creation, get this, holds together. So we got the big picture idea, this Upper story, God is in control of everything. But then it gets even more detailed, Acts 17. In him we live and move and have our being. So he goes from the, from, from, from the big picture idea to this macro of your life and my life. In other words, God right now at every moment of my life is deeply interested in what's happening. We've talked about the hairs on our heads. We've talked about how God said he numbered every hair on your head. You know what that means? He doesn't just number the hairs on your head. You don't just have three million hairs on your head. When you are mad at your kids and you pull out your hair, you know what God says? 
Well, that's here, number 7, 12, and 237,513 that just got pulled out. That's how detailed he is in your life. He didn't just say, I'm giving you hair and I'm going to give you 3 million. I mean, he numbered them. Think about that. He has a relationship with your hair. I mean, it's crazy, but if you think about it even more, we put that God in a box. Let me read another quote from Max Licato. Box-sized gods. You'll find, them in tight, in, you'll find them in the tight grip of people who prefer a God that they can manage, control, and predict. This topsy-turvy life requires a tame deity. We need a God that we can control, a comforting presence akin to the lap, to a lap dog or a cat. Oh, man. We call, and he comes. We pet, and he purrs. And if we can just keep God in his place, that is crazy. But we do it. You know what Jesus says about birds? Not one of them falls without him knowing it. You know what the Bible says about dewdrops? God fathered the dewdrops is what it says. You know, the sun and the moon, God says he set them in the, in the skies and then he set the order from which they'll rise and they'll set. That's what the Bible says. Rainbows, they have very little to do, well, it has scientifically something to do with refraction of water, but it has a lot more to say about God's covenant with this guy Noah, that he would be faithful to him. And I'm making this covenant that I will never let this happen to you again, what happened to you before. You know what the Bible says about animals eating? It says that they don't hunt their own prey. It says God sets the prey before the lioness. That's what the Bible says about the living God. And that means he's looking at every detail of your life. He set out every aspect of you, the number of days you're going to live. Look at Acts 17 or, Acts, or uh, Psalm 139, and you'll see that. He, provid in his providence and his sovereignty, placed you in the family that you were placed in, whether it's a good or a bad family. He set you in the place where you were going to. He set you here this morning. In his providence, he sees what you need. And he determined the length of your days. He determined the things that he allows in your life. And if you catch a hold of that truth, if you grab on to that reality that he has that much vested in you, that's when your view of Jesus begins to change. When you see he's literally orchestrating the elements of your life. So here's what I would say. God created everything for relationship. And because of his sovereignty, I can trust in that relationship. You know what that means? I don't have the ability to control my own life. But he does. He has the ability to control my life. So what do I do with this? What do I even do with this whole thing of responding to this big picture of God's sovereignty? I love the way it puts it in Psalm 115. Our God is in heaven and he does whatever he pleases. So as you sit here today, you may be really ticked off at God because something he did. But he did it, hear me, because he was pleased to do it. And you say, how could he do that? He's not showing love to me because I'm hurting and I'm sad and I need money. I need healing. He's doing it for this overarching picture that you can grab something greater about who he is than what you're looking at today. That's what we're talking about. So what do I do? Well, what, what's this all about? Well, that comes down to big idea number two. So God is in control, but guess what? That means I'm out of control. Write this down. For good. I'm out of control for good. We're preparing the coming of the king, right? Right? So we've got to respond to God's sovereignty. We've got to yield control to him. This is an action step. If, 
If God wants relationship with me, and if he sovereignly proves that he's into every detail of my life, that means I can take action on that, right? Well, this takes us back to Matthew chapter 17 and the, and the transfiguration. Because there's three things they did that I think we can do. The first thing we can do is we can cooperate with it. I mean, we just read this box-blowing expedition that Peter, James, and John took with Jesus. And you know what? We see in this text that they had Jesus in a box as well. Like you and I have Jesus in a box. But he's about to take himself out of that box. He's about to show them how much bigger than they think he is than he really is. He wants them to understand that he is capable where they don't think he's capable. And the truth of the matter is, is that they, how do I put this? They had certainty. They, they, they were certain about certain things, but those certain things they were certain about had to do with them. What they thought, what they felt, what they believed. That's what they were certain in. And he was about to show them that is a small thing to be certain of in life. And in this story, because of his relationship with these three guys, he takes them up a mountain. Verse 1, Jesus took with him, Peter, with him Peter, James, and John, the brother of James, and he led them up a high mountain by themselves. And there he was transfigured before them. And his face shone like the sun, and his clothes became as white as the light. He led them up, and what did they do? They followed him. They cooperated with him. That's what they did. And what happened? He, like, came out of the box, didn't he? Let me read to you what Max Lucado said about this moment. Light spilled out of him. Brilliant, explosive, shocking. Brightness poured through every pore of his skin and every stitch in his robe. It was Jesus on fire. To look at his face was to look squarely into Alpha Centauri. And Mark wants us to know that Jesus' clothes shimmered glistened white, whiter than any bleach could make them. And this radiance was not the work of laundry, it was the presence of God. Scripture equates God with light and light with holiness. God is light, and in Him there is no darkness at all. And in a flash, the disciples' view of Jesus changed. Now you need to understand something. They had watched Him do miracles, they had heard him preach. They had watched him raise the dead. They had watched him cast out demons. They sat with him in evenings when they were just talking and hanging out with Jesus. But you know what all of those things were? Those are things that Jesus did for people. This day, they saw who Jesus was. That's what they saw. The real, true Jesus I just think if they hadn't have even gone up there. But that day they became certain, but they became certain of something far more than just what they thought, of their view of things. They became certain of a sovereign God. Jot this down. God's sovereignty allows me to participate in a life full of certainties. You want to know what those certainties are? Listen to this. He thought of everything. Provided for everything that we could possibly need. Letting us in on his plans that he took uh, such delight in making. He set it all before us in Christ. A long range plan which, in which everything would be brought together and subbed up in him. Everything in deepest heaven and everything on planet earth. In other words, you can live a certain life. We think life is uncertain, but he's saying, man, life is certain. I mean, we can be certain that we don't know everything, but we can be certain who does. That God knows everything. And he's let us in on a whole bunch of those things, hasn't he? He's let us in on this vision he has for you and me to love him with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength. Love our neighbors as ourselves. He's given this vision of giving ourselves to him in love and adoration and worship. He's given us this vision of growing in him, becoming more like him, letting him rub off on me rather than trying to do the other and having me rub off on him. We know the end of the story. We know that Jesus is coming back. He's let us in on this. We know that we're going to step into an eternity in heaven. We know we're going to party in heaven with him. These are realities. These are things that we know for a fact. We know that he wants to grow us 
as a family of believers. These are things that the Lord Jesus shared with us. These are the reasons that he gives these things to us because he loves us. And we even know that when the struggles of our lives are happening, when the world is coming apart around us, even at those moments, we still kind of know what's going on, if we're really honest, don't we? That he's working his will out in our lives. Isn't that amazing? But it's true. I mean, isn't that the story of Job? If there was ever anyone, he was called, you know what the Bible, how the Bible described him? Most righteous man on earth. That's what the Bible says about him. And yet he lost his house, he lost his wealth, his health, his family, he lost everything. No reason to do it. And yet he never turned on God. And Job never knew why this happened to him. But we do. God put it in the Bible so that we would know why this happened to him. You know why it happened to him? It was this luminous, so bright you can't look him in the face, God that goes in front of Satan and in your face is (laughs) him. You think you can turn this guy from me? You can't because I want to show you, Satan, all the principalities and the power and powers of darkness. I want to show you all the power of someone who won't turn from me. I want to show you that you can't grab him out of my hand because he serves me and not you and not the things that belong to him. Not his health, not his wealth, not his family. He serves me first. And he said to him, Satan, I dare you to snatch him out of my hand because you can't do it. Now think of that for you. Just think of Jesus saying, Satan, go at it with Larry. Give it to him because you can't snatch him away. You know who my Job is? my wife, Elma. There are days that she can't sleep all night. There are days that she can't work at all. There's days that she can only do things for four or five hours. There's days that she's in great pain. We have prayed. We continue to pray. We claim her healing. We accept her healing. But in the meantime... She follows Jesus with her heart, her soul, her mind, and her strength. And any of you that knows her knows that she loves you as she loves Jesus. Folks, that's a success story in the kingdom of God. It's just a success story. She's my Job. And the truth is she kind of shows us that life is pretty certain. Certain in who he is and his sovereignty. And when I recognize that, there's two responses I have. is to be able to obey him and be able to pray to him. What do I do? I obey what he says. I obey it as a response to sovereignty. In all your ways acknowledge him and he will make your path straight. And then we pray in response to sovereignty. I cry out to the Most High, to God who fulfills His purposes for me. And when I obey God, you know what's happening? I am bringing my actions into line with His sovereignty. When I pray, you know what I'm doing? I am bringing my will into line with God's thinking. That's what that's all about. And here's the reason why. We need to do this desperately. Because there's a battle that wages It's this battle of uncertainties, this battle of what I want, this battle of what I think. And my agenda sometimes is different than God's agenda. And so this battle rages within us. And I've got a choice of what to do with that. God says, you obey me. God says, you pray to me. And then what does he say? I'll make your path straight, as it says in Proverbs 3. You know what it says in James chapter 4? When you say, today or tomorrow I'm going to do something, listen to this. You boast and brag. So we are arrogant enough, and we just, I mean, I do this all the time. I'm arrogant enough to think, well, next week, let's go this. But, you know, but the truth is, you know what James says we're supposed to do? You just add a little statement. You say, if God wills, 
I'm going to go to my kids' house this afternoon. If God wills, then I'm going to get an extra paycheck because I work overtime next week. If God wills, if God wills, if God wills. You are looking at God and saying, God, here is my request. Your beautiful, amazing will be done. That's really what we're doing. Second thing we can do is reflect on it. We reflect on it. We don't, you know, we, we do more. And jot this down. God's sovereignty allows me to see the big picture. I want you to look at the, put yourself in the disciples' shoes. Not only did they see Jesus transfigured, guess what else they saw? They saw Elijah and they saw Moses. I mean, rock star people, right? I mean, man, I'd be pumped if I saw Elijah and Moses if I was in my bedroom tonight and I saw that. That would be pretty cool. And so you expect this. What does Peter do? Listen to this. Lord, it is good for us to be here. I'd say, yeah, that's probably really true. Um, If you wish, let us make three tabernacles, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. Now, what was the whole point of this discussion? That sounds like a good idea, right? This is like this awesome mountaintop moment, Jesus. Let's celebrate. Let's like make three tabernacles here, right? One for each of the three of you. I want to tell you, Max Licato puts it this way. Peter's idea of three tabernacles, get this, was so off base and inappropriate that God wouldn't permit him to finish his sentence. (laughs) While he was still speaking, behold, a bright cloud overshadowed them, and suddenly a voice came out of the cloud saying, This is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. Hear him. Beloved means priceless and unique. In other words, there is no one like Jesus, not Moses, not Elijah, not Peter, not Buddha, not Mohammed. Peter misses this. He places Christ in a respectable box labeled great men of history. Oh, man. He wanted to give Jesus equal honor, but God would have none of it. Christ has no counterparts. This was the moment of Peter's box. Jesus was so way outside of it and so in his, uh, and so in his love, God wanted Peter to be set straight. Isn't that amazing? He wants Peter to be set straight. Peter, I mean, really, I created these guys. Think about it. I want to set you straight. So I'm going to show you the difference between me and them. Lights, blaring, everything else. And he shows the difference. And so what do we do with this? I mean, what do you and I do until we really see Jesus? Well, what we usually do is we usually do two things. Life isn't going well. I'm not having a good time, so what do we do? We get angry and we take action. What's the thing you say when something is going on and you don't like what God's doing? Why are you doing this to me? What did I do wrong, God? How dare you? Why is this happening? We, that's what we say, right? And what's the response? The response is, we want to take action. I want to get this out of my life. It's fast and easy and as quickly as I can possibly do it. I want to get this out of my life. We take action. But there are two better ways to respond. And that's to rest and reflect. Let me give you a biblical example of this. This amazing guy named David is having an awful time. His own son is trying to overtake him is trying to conquer him, is trying to take the kingship from him. And he leads this insurrection, and he's got these, they call the mighty men of valor, these guys that he's hanging out with, and they're going along. And then this, I don't even know how to put it, this awful, awful man, Shimei, gets in David's face, and he's throwing rocks at him, and he's throwing, hurling insults at him and stuff like that. And he's screaming, you're a man of blood! You're a warrior. You just destroy people. You've destroyed everything. You're no good. You deserve what you're getting. How dare you? You're nothing but a soldier. You're no king. And oh man, Abishai, one of these mighty men of valor, he comes to David and he is incensed. And in 2 Samuel chapter 16, he says two things. The two things he wants to do, he says, 
Why should a dead dog curse my Lord the King? And then he says, let me go over there and cut his head off. I mean, talk about action. Let's genocide this project, just cut his head off, and then you don't have that problem anymore. And yet David, this man after God's own heart, just kind of shakes his head. He says, bud, sometimes I just don't think we're on the same page. Let's not get mad. Let's not take action. Let's rest and let's reflect. This man of God, who was having insults hurled at him, said, let's consider what this guy's saying. Why? Because there was some truth to it. Do you know David never built the temple? You know why David never built the temple? Because God said, you're a man of blood. You're a warrior. You're a soldier. So what he was saying was true. Now, mind you, Shimei is responsible before the living God for the way he did these things. But this humble man, this David, saw the sovereignty of God working through the enemy. And he said, let's rest and let's reflect. That's what he was doing. And that's what God wants us to be able to do. And there's a haunting question as we move back to our buddies, Peter, James, and John, that we really need to reflect on and ask ourselves. And that question is this. When was the last time that the presence of Jesus in your life, took your breath away? When was the last time that you saw so clearly who Jesus really was that you were on your knees and on your face before him? That his glory was so bright you couldn't even look in his face? That's a very important question because the third step speaks to that. And if you only had the first two steps that I'm going to cooperate with God and I'm going to reflect on life, you'd end up fatalistic. Because all you'd be doing is those two things. I'm going to cooperate with God's sovereignty and I'm going to reflect on life and then I'm going to fall apart because life is going to fall apart. It's like the guy, I love the story of the guy, first time he was ever talked about, about his sovereignty, uh, God's sovereignty in his life. He got really mad, stormed out of church, goes home, falls down the stairs. Gets up, brushes himself off, says, well, I'm glad that one's over and I'm waiting for the next thing God does to me. You ever had that happen to you? Why are you doing this to me, God? You did this, and I'm just waiting for the next foot to fall, right? I mean, that's what we do, right? But that's not what God wants us to do. The third thing he wants us to do, he does want us to cooperate. He does want us to reflect. But then he wants us to celebrate his sovereignty. In good times and in bad, he wants us to give it to him. How do I do that? I allow him out of the box. I say, you be all of Jesus, not just the part of me that I need, or maybe I don't need you at all and I keep you all in the box. You celebrate it. You realize you're not in control, he is. You begin to see the big picture. You begin to see ways in which you can worship him. Because if you haven't seen the real Jesus, you don't understand this. But look at what happens here. When the disciples heard this, they fell face down to the ground, terrified. Wow. Wow. But Jesus came and touched them. Get up, he said, don't be afraid. And we've been talking about fear for eight weeks, right? In this whole series about idolatry and the fear of what God is going to do to people, you know, like, the old, like in the Old Testament. Well, how can fear and celebrate happen together because they're complete opposites? Let me read you once again what Max Licato says. They were gripped deep in their gut that God was at once everywhere and here. The very sight of the glowing Galilean sucked all the air and arrogance out of them, leaving them appropriately prostrate. This, folks, is the fear of the Lord. Most of our fears are poisonous. They steal sleep and pillage peace. But this fear, oh, it's different. From a biblical perspective, there is nothing neurotic about fearing God. The neurotic thing is not to be afraid or to be afraid, get this, to be afraid of the wrong thing. 
That's why God chooses to be known in a different way to you. So that you won't fear the wrong thing. Jesus says, you know what? You may want to control what's going on in your life, but I don't want you to. Because I will show you great and mighty things that you do not yet know. That's what he says. He wants us to stand in awe of those things. Jot this down. God's sovereignty allows me to surrender control of my life with confidence and with joy. If you look back on your Christian life, you can see the good things that have happened and you can see bad things that have happened, right? And we can. But can you see in both of those, can you see places in which God got a hold of you and completely changed your life as a result of it? He even used the bad things to transform you into a new creation, a new person in Him. Have you ever had that happen to you? You know, as I prepared this sermon, I mean, I've thought a lot, long and hard, and I thought about how God really did. He put me here today and put my two feet right here so I could preach to you guys. And then I thought about my past and even getting here. I have talked to you about my fear of public speaking. And I'm not afraid of speaking to people. I'm afraid of speaking God's word to people. What if I get it wrong? What if I say the wrong thing? What if I actually steer you away from Jesus and not toward Jesus? That petrifies me. I never wanted to do that. And it still scares me, this whole idea of preaching to people. But I got to tell you, the signs were there my whole life. I mean, when I was in high school, I was a mess. I was a mess. I had no clue what to do with my life. And I take this assessment to find out what you're going to do with the rest of your life. What's your vision for your life? And I go down and I sit in the counselor's office and he looks at this test and literally he goes like this. He says, I have no idea what you should do with your life. That's a, that's a direct quote. That's what he said to me. And then he says, maybe... Maybe you could be a fireman or a priest because you have a tendency to want to help people. I mean, me, the son of an alcoholic father and an angry mother, a priest. <laughs> Lo and behold, the sovereignty of God. From the mouth of someone who had no idea, right? And I thought about the first time I even preached here. Tom Collins, this was, I mean, I didn't eat, it was the first time I ever preached. I was doing nothing but mowing lawns here. I mean, I was just doing whatever was needed to be done. And Tom calls me and says, would you preach? And I was petrified to preach. And I go to God and say, please help me not to preach. Let anything happen. Let the world in so I don't need to preach. <laughs> and I ended up preaching, and God saw me through that. And God told me this week, I'll see you through this Sunday too. God bless you, sister. And each of you has a story like that. Where you have been down and out and petrified and didn't know what to do and God has said, I got a hold of you. I love you. I am bigger than you see me. I am not just exorcist Jesus. I am not just the sacred heart of Jesus. I'm not even just resurrection Jesus. I am all of those rolled into one. And I want you to celebrate that. I want you to fall in love with that. So we celebrate his sovereignty. I mean, why fear the future? Why fear him being in control? And I'd say some of you need to get on with the program. Some of you need to begin to recognize I'm not qualified to run my life anymore. I don't want to run my life anymore. Let me close with a statement by Max Licato. When Christ is great, our fears are not. As awe of Jesus expands, fears of life diminish. A big God translates into big courage. A small view of God generates no courage. A limp, puny, fireless Jesus has no power over cancer cells corruption, identity theft, stock market crashes, or global calamity. A packageable, 
portable Jesus might fit well in a purse or a shelf, but he does nothing with your fears. This must be why Jesus took the disciples up the mountain. He saw the box in which they had confined him, and he saw the future that awaited them. He saw the fireside denial of Peter. He saw the prisons of Jerusalem and Rome, the demands of the church, the persecutions of Nero, and a box-sized version of Jesus simply would not work. So Jesus blew the sides out of their perceptions. I will tell you as we go to our offering that Jesus wants to blow your socks off too. You know what it says in Romans 8? It says all things work together for the glory of God. For those who are called according to his purpose. You know what I recognize about that? I can't do Romans 8.28. I can't make all things be for the glory of God. But he can. You know what I would say at this stage of my life? And it's taken me 64 years to get there. I don't want to be in control of my life. I don't want to be. Because I have found in all those years that every time I take control, I fall apart. And he doesn't want you to be in control either. He wants you to not worship a knee-high Jesus or a head-high Jesus or a mountain-high Jesus. He wants you to worship the most high Jesus. And that is that moment of transfiguration when your life is completely changed. We're going to go to our offering now. Can we pray? I pray for you today to surrender. Abdicate the throne. Give up control. Give yourself to Jesus in a whole new way. Whatever it is that you've been fearing, humbling yourself about, humble yourself today. I pray for these people here today, Father, that they would see a transfigured you in their lives. I pray that they would see how small that they have made you and that they would decide, you know what, Lord Jesus? I need to cooperate with you. I need to reflect on the life that you've given me and I need to celebrate your sovereignty in that life. So here I am, Jesus. As I prepare for the coming of the King this Christmas, I say to you, I want this Christmas to be different. And I know to do that, I need to give up control forever. So I give myself to you now. In Jesus' name, amen. Thanks, folks.